Good morning, everyone. So we'll get started today. So this is almost a re-airing, but I don't think too many people looked at the YouTube video. So I had put a video up of these solutions. Um, if there's any particular topics, I don't know if I can find a question quickly, but at some point, um, if maybe uh, within about 10 minutes into class, maybe I'll stop and just see if there's any particular topics that we want to wrap up with, uh, discussions of. But we'll start today with the sig fig problem. Um, so these sig fig problems sometimes are really silly because the thing that makes this problem silly is you're taking 50 plus 74, and the, the thought process would probably be, well, 74 was good to two sig figs. Why wouldn't 50 be good to two sig figs? And the answer is, well, unless we know something about that, that zero, we're assuming it's not significant. So we're looking at 50 and just saying it has one sig fig. And so it's just some different type of unit. A lot of times when the exam does this, I don't like it. I like thinking of the whole point here should be that we should be attaching units to this. Like these numbers are supposed to represent inexact quantities and it's the inherent impreciseness of an actual like measurement that we take that leads to the sig fig rules. It's not the arithmetic itself. It's not just 50 plus 74 should be rounded to 120, which is the sort of answer here by sig fig rules is that we should round this to 120. We're looking at placeholders when we add and subtract or decimal places. So we're rounding to that tens placeholder because 50 only had one sig fig to that particular decimal place. Now, if you imagine that the scenario would be we use one ruler to get 74 that was more precise of a tool than the one that we use to get the 50. So the implication when you see these numbers is that you just have to imagine that every number you see is just you know, some number that's reflective of a lab measurement good to that number of sig figs that you would interpret off the number that you see. So when you see 50 with no context, that's just one sig fig. Now we contrasted this with some examples and one of these here I think it's into this is that when you do a calculation on your calculator and you see 50, that it's a different story. That if you had gotten 50 on your calculator screen by the problem 25 meters or whatever the units were, if you took 25 plus 25, where both of these numbers here were good to that ones placeholder, your calculator says 50, this isn't one of those tricks where you say, oh, my calculator says 50, that's one sick big. No, we're looking at the actual math and the problem, the numbers that were given were good to the ones placeholder, so 50 is good to that second placeholder. So this is 50 with two sig figs based on this problem here. Or we could go you know, 5.0 times 10 to the one if we want to go scientific notation um, to report the number to clearly show two sig figs. Okay, the second problem here I think gets into this issue where our calculator, if we just plug this in here, if we do 16 times 1.25 and then divide by um, the sum of 1.25 and 3.75, our calculator will just say five. So a cal and that's maybe not well written, but this should just, our calculator says five if we type this in. And so the question would be, well, is it five? Is it 5.0? Is it 5.00? 5.000? How many sig figs should we write after the five? Well, we'll just look at the problem. We do a multiplication step, three sig figs times three sig figs. That should have three significant figures. Sometimes it might matter what the actual number is. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, let's actually just do the calculation real quick. 16 times 1.25 is 20. So if we're reporting this result here, it'd be 20.0 for that first multiplication step. So our first multiplication step, 20.0, and then we're taking 20.03 sig figs divided by the sum of 1.25 plus 3.75, which should be 5.00. So if we do that math over here, hopefully you agree with me that this should be good to that third sig fig because we're looking at our decimal places when we're adding. And so our result here should be 5.00. So, or maybe I'm mistaken, it should be four in our calculator. Yeah, so it should be four. I was mistaken here from my memory of what the answer was. But we do get a whole number in our calculator is the point. So you do the math in your calculator, you get a whole number. What looks like a whole number, but then we should be taking three sig figs, divide by three sig figs, and adding three significant figures to that result. So sometimes when we do sig fig rules, we're rounding, seeing where we round to, and other times we're actually adding zeros, like in this example here. We're finding out how many zeros are significant in our result. Now, you can imagine the importance here is if you're determining the density of an object, we've precisely determined the density of this object to be 4.00 grams per milliliter, let's say, if that's what the units were. 
And, and that precision matters. You know, if we're doing some further calculations, we, we would be, you know, it would be useful to know it was good to three sig figs and not one or two or four, et cetera. The last step here has some scientific notation. Now, sometimes scientific notation is confusing, but if we, like, one trick that we could do is always just go to a whole number and then do the math and then look at the sig figs and kind of maybe go back to scientific notation if we have to. So I look at this number here, and what really becomes the issue with scientific notation is this problem here. If I just do the math on my calculator, it's going to be something times 10 to the 5, and almost everybody will be tricked into thinking it should only have three sig figs, because they're thinking it should be like to the tenth to the hundredth place because you're adding two values to the hundredth place. Well, let's just write these numbers out as full numbers, and we'll see what happens when we add them up. So I think the first one would be 47400 is 4.74 times 10 to the 4. The second one would be 78700. And I think you can kind of see what, what happens in this problem is we get like an extra sig fig like we often get when we add and subtract because we're looking at our decimal places or our placeholders. So our result should be good to that one number here should be good to that hundreds placeholder. And so when we go back to scientific notation, we'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This should be 1.261 times 10 to the 5. And again, if you just put this in your calculator without expressing the whole numbers, if you just type 4.74 E4, 7.87 E4, uh, E4, our calculator would probably say, it would probably actually say this is a number, it would probably say 126100, fully written out. We could force it into scientific notation, but do you see how we might be tricked into thinking we should round to the hundredths place because these were to the hundredths place, but the multiple changes the decimal place, like the times 10 to the four versus times 10 to the five changes that decimal placeholder value where it's lying. And so we're good to the one the 100 placeholder, which times 10 to the 5 will be the thousands placeholder. So the key is, if you're going from a number into scientific notation, you just keep the same number of sig figs. You just go from four sig figs to four sig figs. Just like we went from here, the 50 having two sig figs into scientific notation still, and then more clearly showing two sig figs. So when we use scientific notation, often it's more clear to give the reader of the number how many sig figs there are with the number, but there's no difference in looking at a number in full number form, uh, the full numerical value versus scientific notation. They should have identical sig figs, and these two numbers here agree by having four total sig figs. I thought that was a question. <laughs> okay. I threw this in here. I figure, okay, you come here today. My dog's name is, uh, is Chubb. Um, so I thought this kind of neat. So he has his own little uh, Nick Chubb jersey. And we actually named him Nick Chubb for some reason. It just really confuses our vet. So they always call up and they're, they're like, oh, we have Nick's uh, prescription. And I'm like, who the hell's Nick? And then they're like, what? So I think I'm, they dialed the wrong number. Oh, you mean Chubb. So we should just name him Chubb instead of Nick Chubb. But uh, how do I move this over? And here, here's him. Uh, I think that's when I told him the Browns are usually not very good. <laughs> He's like, what? <laughs> right. So that's my dog. I forgot to share that with you guys since you're here today or watching later. OK, let's look at one more. I think this is the last sig fig question in the notes. OK, so we have this number here. We're doing a subtraction step, then we're doing a multiplication step. Let's look at this first addition step here. This is the one that caught everybody off guard on the test when we took this. This is from probably seven or eight years ago. We had this on an actual midterm. 1163. This is almost the same thing we were just talking about, where the mistake a lot of students made, and I can understand the mistake, and I, I don't like the question because of this. It's like, well, how could you have 20 to one sig fig, but then 1163 somehow to that one's placeholder. And you just have to imagine a different ruler or a different device was used for the 20 and the 1163. And it invariably leads to the question of like, why on earth would somebody have been more precise with the 1163, the really big number, and so imprecise with the really small number? And it's like, I, I don't know. Like, it's just sometimes the way data is presented to us in problems. I think the one example, I think we talked about this in class really early in chapter one, was if you had like $1,000, like somebody's like, how much money do you have in your bank? And like, I don't know, about 1000 
jerseys aren't really conducive to microphones, it turns out. Okay, uh, so if you had about $1,000 in your checking account, not precise, you just estimate that's how much you have. Somebody gives you $20, do you have $1,020? The answer is no. So the, where your preciseness lies in a number impacts the math that you're gonna do with the value. So if we're really imprecise, the 20 plus or minus 10 is the implication of 20 with one sig fig. And so it's that plus or minus 10 that gives us that same kind of uncertainty when we add these numbers up. And we end up rounding to the, the tens placeholder, so we'd get 1183 with the full number, but we would round that to 1180. Now the notion of should you round once in a problem, um, like, or should we keep this 1183 and just kind of note the eight for now and keep the three, doesn't make too much of a difference on an exam problem. I would just say probably on a test problem, just round and, not, and don't worry too much about it because a lot of times we'll outthink ourselves. A lot of times I've seen students say, I know this is three sig figs, they keep the three and then they think it's four later. So I think just make it 1180 if you have to just to see that that's three sig figs here. And then we take the uh, 15.160 and we're gonna lose most of the sig figs on the second number, zero, zero, eight, six, three. So we're gonna round this to the thousands placeholder from the 15.160 value. But also make sure that we see that that trailing zero is of course significant because it was given in the number. If it wasn't significant, it wouldn't have been written with the number. And so I get 15.15137. So that would have five sig figs. So 15.151. And then we're gonna multiply that by 1180. 1180 with three sig figs, 15.151 with five sig figs. The result should be rounded to the value with fewer sig figs. When we multiply, we're counting sig figs. Three times five sig figs goes to three sig figs. So this question here is just looking for not the numerical answer, just the number of sig figs. Um, so just three sig figs in our final result here for this problem. But this just comes down to the sequential application of the sig fig rules. And I don't think either the rules are complicated. It's just operationally, when we do multi-steps, we just have to keep straight, we add and subtract. We use the decimal place rule. We look at where the decimal places lie. We multiply and divide. We use the sig fig rule. We count the sig figs. Okay, let's look at this nomenclature problem here. This one here tells us aluminum oxalate, which oxalate's not in our nomenclature, but they're telling us information about it here so that we can use what oxalate is in determining iron two oxalate. So if aluminum oxalate is Al2, Cr, uh, Al2, C2O4, O3, then can we work out the charge of this? This is, this is really the part of the problem is, can we work out the charge of the C2O4? And I think we can, because we know aluminum can only be a three plus cation. So we have a six plus coming from the two aluminums, meaning we have a six minus to balance out the charge from the three oxalate ions. So that's how we can work out the charge on oxalate, like carbonate and sulfate is a two minus ion. So C2O4 has the overall charge of minus two. And so then if we have a minus two ion paired up with iron two, Fe2 is just iron two plus. So then we just have a one to one pairing. So just Fe, C2O4. And so we didn't have to know ahead of time what oxalate was, we were told information. So this is a problem that occasionally you see on tests that gives you an ion you don't know how to name and then we're just using our ideas of charge uh, we could even have said, now it doesn't really exist, but like, what would you think the formula would be for like iron oxalite? Like, it doesn't really exist, so we'd probably never go there, but oxalite would just have one fewer O, presumably. So it would be like C2O3, still with the two minus. So, not a great example because it doesn't really exist, but just to show the whole idea of ite would be one fewer O, just takes the name ite, but keeping the charge the same. Just like carbonite would be CO3, well, CO3 is two minus is carbonate, so carbonite would be CO2, two minus. So just trying to apply that rule of adding, uh, removing an O changes the ite. If you take a second O away, which isn't all that common, only in the ClO3, BrO3, IO3s do we see that going to like ClO minus, so that's hypochlorite. And then if you add the O, which also we only see in that trend of the chlorine, bromine, iodine with oxygen, 
So ClO4, this would be the per. So this would be perchlorate. So I think this kind of wraps up some naming uh, questions. So let's go through these here. Um, so aluminum, hydrogen, phosphite. Let's just start aluminum. Well, let's even start real basic. That this has to be an ionic compound because we see a metal, and then we see what would be some non-metallic uh, elements bonded together. So hydrogen phosphite is based off of phosphite. So phosphite is from phosphate. Um, so what's phosphate? Phosphate is PO4, 3 minus. So if this is what we have memorized, we should get the phosphite by changing that to a 3. And then a hydrogen out in front is just an H plus ion added on to PO3, 3 minus. So that would go to HPO4 or HPO3 with a 2 minus charge, kicking that unit of charge down. We could do it again for the dihydrogen phosphite would be H2PO3 with now a minus charge. So we've gone from minus 3 to minus 2 to minus. If we do this a third time, go to H3PO3, then this is now what we call an acid. That would be phosphorus acid. So Now, a question I get sometimes is, aren't these things here technically acids? And they could behave as acids, and we'll talk about that behavior later, we just don't name them as being acids here in Chapter 2. So behavior of acids, we talk a little bit, a little bit about it in our chapter four that we'll see after midterm one. And then you'll see it again in much greater detail in chapter 16 and 17 in Chem 1220. So to kind of complete this question, HPO4 is a two minus, and so we just have two and then three. And then I like to just make sure that we're not including the charges in the name, so I just lasso out everything with the charges. Um, chromium six oxide, is chromium six plus, oxide's a two minus. So this would be CrO3. And again, occasionally we're taken aback. Like any time this is on a test, I guarantee you somebody falls for the Cr6O or the CrO6 because they think that's what the six has to do with. The six doesn't have to do with the number of oxygens or chromiums in the compound, just the charge of chromium. And that's a charge of oxide that then sets the ratio of chromium to oxygen. So cesium is in the alkali group. It's like sodium. It's a plus. So we got a plus 2. And so a plus 2 over here gives us a minus 2 for the two oxygens. So if I have a minus 2 charge, but for two oxygens, that's not an oxide anymore. Oxides are minus 2 for each O. And so this would be cesium peroxide. So peroxide being O2 with a 2 minus charge. H2SO3 is derived off of sulfate, but sulfate's SO4. Sulfite is SO3 with a 2 minus. So this is the acid. So this is also an acid. It's the acid of sulfite. It's sulfurous. So it's OUS acid. So the OUS acid is the, the acid name for an anion that has the ite ending. <laughs> I keep forgetting the L, no, it's sulfite. So the ites go to us acid, ates go to ic acid, ides go to hydroic acid. So HCl, chloride, hydrochloric acid, HBr, bromide, hydrobromic acid. So the hydro out in front just indicates the anion has the IDE ending. This is methanol. Sometimes methanol is a little confusing with the one below it, which is acetic acid. But the, um, I've mentioned this a couple times before. Maybe this is annoying to keep hearing over and over again. I think we would write HC2, H3O2 as acetic acid's formula, just so you can see the H out in front, followed by the anion that you can recognize as acetate a little easier. This is sometimes an easier way to write the formula of acetic acid before we get to molecular structure. If you've seen, and you can kind of picture maybe the whole like acetic acid, and if we take a, a short little detour, I mean, it's really not that hard to kind of piece together what this thing looks like 
and then we'll be sketching these things later in chapter nine, but it's just kind of the sequential CH3 and then the COOH is this group here. We'll talk about this a little bit more in chapter four, a little bit more in structurally to write these kinds of formulas in chapter nine, and then you'll see more properties of acids again, 16 and 17 and 1220. So that's acetic acid. Periodic acid is probably the wrong pronunciation. Per iodic acid might help you see that's per iodate. Per iodate, like per chlorate, is IO4 minus, and so this would be HIO4. And then nonanol is just off of nonane. Nonane is the hydrocarbon um, with nine carbons. We should have 20 hydrogens for nonane. So known and all will be C9H19OH. And then we just connect. If, if, if you're not sure, the, 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 the probably easiest place where you're caught up on is how do I know for sure there's 19 hydrogens plus that hydroxyl group? Well, if you just sketch out the nine carbons, I think that's nine, and then attach enough bonds with hydrogen to give four bonds to each carbon. So that makes the ends have two CH3 groups each, and then the internal ones have CH2s. <coughs> then we just replace any one of these hydrogens with that hydroxyl group. We'll do the end position. We're giving that the hydroxyl group. And as long as we counted right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so ch 2 is in the middle. There's seven of them. That should be 14, 17, 18, 19. So C9, H19, and then the hydroxyl group. So the, like, in terms of the opening experiments in chapter two, what should we know? Let's talk about a few details of those experiments. Let's um, mention also, John Dalton's name's mentioned in the first part of chapter two has uh, the opening section on Dalton's atomic theory, which is probably about as crude of a theory as you can have because it just kind of gave the idea that um, matter would be comprised of spheres and each of the spheres are different for the different elements where there was really no scientific basis for that theory, just kind of more like a, a good hypothesis. And it was these later experiments that were getting into the actual atomic nature of matter, and then also the subatomic nature of matter. Um, the discovery of the electron was J.J. Thompson, cathode ray tube experiment. We saw that in person here in class. If you weren't here, the video's up on, on Carmen from the, the day in lecture we talked about this. And we saw that we were creating um, those um, um, sort of beta rays that we came to know them as later, those electron particles. And we saw it was a particle because the particle could hit a pinwheel and made it move. If it were just a light particle, you could shine light on an object. It doesn't make the object move because light doesn't carry, um, it doesn't have like a resting mass. So the light's not going to make the particle move. But a particle can make a particle move uh, based on its momentum. So we were seeing that. We also was, wasn't easily able to see, but we were changing the path of the um, rays using a magnetic field. Um, and so th that was the basic experiment J.J. Thompson was doing um, back in the early 1900s. And so that was the discovery of the electron. Um, I like this question here just because it gets us to thinking of maybe why the electron was the first discovered. If you're thinking of the atom as we now know it, nucleus, electrons spinning around the nucleus, easier to kick that electron off than, say, one of the protons or neutrons. So probably not too hard to, the, to, to conceive that the proton, excuse me, that the electron would be the first discovered particle. The proton being positively charged helped it come second. And then the final charge, or the final particle to be detected was the neutron. And that span here is actually like a 30 year difference. It's like, you know, the early, it's like 1903, I think it was, or something for the electron. It's like not until 1932 or somewhere around that ballpark for the formal discovery of the neutron. <clears throat> Has anybody ever seen or even heard of the Neutron Man? Has anybody ever? There used to be this guy. He's named the Neutron Man. He'd be at the Ohio State games, and he would do this like Neutron Man dance. He, he was a peculiar looking guy. I mean, it was like such a, if you have a few seconds, just Google Neutron Man, Ohio State or whatever. Um, it was pretty cool. I think he passed away probably like 
15-ish years ago. So probably why you guys haven't seen or heard of this. But anyways, um, what particles did Curry discover? Well, before let, we talk about that, let's talk about Millikan. Uh, Millikan uh, studied the oil drop. I can't write today or ever, but I can try. The oil drop experiment. And so the oil drop experiment, what this did was it determined the mass of the electron and the charge of the electron. So it established the mass of the electron as being absolutely subatomic. It was like one two thousandth the mass of the lightest known element. And then uh, also established the charge of the electron. Um, and then the, um, the experiment did this by putting a charge on oil droplets and suspending them with a magnetic field and using how much of a field was required to, uh, to, um, to um, stop the droplets from dropping. So that was how we were able to determine the charge and then the mass of the electron. If you recall, this isn't a big detail, but the cathode ray tube experiment gave the mass to charge ratio of the electron. So from the mass to, mass to charge ratio, the oil drop experiment was able to then furnish the actual mass and charge of the electron. Um, not too much about how those experiments were conducted, I think is worth knowing, but just kind of that basic like framework of who, what, um, the when isn't so big, just in terms of early 1900s, I think is the best um, sort of thing to know is that these are happening right at the early 1900s. Let's talk about Curie next. So she was uh, studying the radioactive elements and finding that there's three main pathways of radioactive decay. So if you remember, she had the particles and there was the beta particle, that was the electron. There's the alpha particle, which is the helium nucleus. Helium four with the two plus. And then there's that gamma ray in the middle. The gamma ray wasn't a particle. It couldn't make a pinwheel move, but it did have uh, energy associated with it. It was just a high energy packet of radiation, even higher energy than an X-ray, uh, but just a light particle. Um, so no mass associated with it. The beta ray, the same particle as the cathode ray tube experiment, the electron, and then the alpha particle was discovered, um, the helium nucleus, so a more massive, much more massive particle, wasn't deflected upward very much in the electric field, where the beta ray was, ray was deflected strongly downward due to its, um, due to its uh, small mass. And so um, the, uh, so, that's what Curie is discovering, these radioactive pathways, finding the electron. I think one of the main reasons we talk about this discovery is how that alpha particle was used in the Rutherford experiment. The alpha ray scattering, that was Rutherford, that's the Rutherford gold foil. If you recall, this experiment took a very, very thin sheet of gold and tried to see what happened when you pass, when you shoot this beam of like alpha particles at it. And the thought was, it was almost like meant to mimic tissue paper, that was how thin it was. So the thought was most of the rays would go right through um, and said a lot of them were back scattered and back deflected at large angles. And this is because the, uh, the, the, the presence of nuclei, which they didn't know about at the time. And so this was due to the presence of the strongly Positive nuclei. Look at this. Brown sand. Sorry. Why you help me out? <laughs> It'd be funny if I chucked it across the room. <laughs> um, anyways, and so the uh, uh, so the gold foil experiment was establishing the small positive packets of nuclear charge, not the, the small packets of charge that are relatively massive that then could deflect this alpha particle. Um, and so it was the compact nuclei that was the discovery of this experiment. So the nucleus was the main conclusion. Is that we get that modern atomic theory of protons, neutrons, electrons, protons, neutrons in the nucleus, electrons surrounding the nucleus. Okay, so just kind of basic names, basic idea of the experiments, or what I would um, take away from those opening experiments. Let's come back to a stoichiometry problem. Um, so there's all kinds of stoichiometry problems, ways of wording them. Um, this one here is giving us H2 and O2 in a closed container. And it says, after the reaction is complete, we have six moles of water have been produced 
by four, uh, and four moles of oxygen remain. Again, that based on the theoretical yield, I, should, I, I would say based on the reaction going to completion, how many total moles of gas were initially present in the container? And the first thing that I would just take note of or just think about is how we would have the reactants present and then none of the water initially. And that's the first thing that may not be entirely obvious, but whenever we're talking about this reaction here, we're not told anything about water initially being in the container, so we're imagining a container that only contained hydrogen and oxygen. And so a few ways that we may think of solving this problem are the BCA chart um, in the notes from the video that I put up. I actually did the BCA chart second. I'm gonna start with that one here because whoever wrote this question was really thinking of a BCA chart. Like this is like what like somebody in my profession would call a BCA chart problem. I don't like to write questions that way that kind of try to lead you into using a BCA chart because I think there's so many ways to solve a stoichiometry problem. Why kind of write a problem specifically with one chart in mind? I've seen questions where they actually give you a chart. We don't do this anymore, but sometimes the lab does this where they give you like information in a BCA chart and kind of force you to use one where it's a little bit confusing. But I think that the best way the BCA chart can start is at least with the thought that water zero and I have an unknown amount of the H2 and the O2 at the moment. And then my change would be, well, however much I have of H2 and O2 are losing, but in the order of 2x for H2, x for O2, and we're gaining 2x for water. And then it's this here with the gaining of water to six moles where we can start solving the problem. Like right off the bat, you can solve for x, that x is equal to three moles. And then the problem is almost done. I mean, the problem is almost like right in front of us where the O2 is remaining at four moles from what we're told in the problem. So we're told in the problem, four moles of oxygen remains after the reaction's complete. So we initially had to have seven moles, right? So initially we would have had to have had here seven moles. So I can subtract X, which is three moles, to get four moles left over. So I know that there's seven moles of O2 initially present in that container at this point in the problem. And then the only other thing that's maybe a little bit confusing is that this reaction, based on theoretical yield, based on it going to completion, one of these two had to go to zero, so hydrogen's at zero. So if oxygen is at zero, or excuse me, if there was some oxygen left over, the reaction went to completion based on the theoretical yield, then the other element, or the other reactant has to be equal to zero in terms of its amount after the reaction is complete. So based on that, means that we should have had six moles of hydrogen present in that container. So we could lose two X minus two times three to get zero. And so how many moles of gas were initially present in the container? Well, the six moles of H2 plus the seven moles of O2, 13 moles of gas. Now, the application in metro analysis is just as easy, or maybe even easier. I, the, the only tricky part is this, is that you might ask these questions here with the metro analysis, number of moles of H2 that it took to produce six moles of water. And for every two moles of water, we need two moles of H2. So that'd be 6.0 moles of H2 required to be initially present but do you see how the vocabulary there, like the whole thought of this step being how much H2 was required to produce this much water, and so when I get the six moles, that means I initially had to have six moles of H2 present. So there's like a lot of thought that's going in that kind of looks like this here in the BCA chart. So a lot of the thought of the BCA chart is in this dimensional analysis step. And if we're just trying to replicate the step and memorize it, sometimes we lose that. So just know that if you're just memorizing when to use dimensional analysis, sometimes we need to make sure we have the vocabulary down on what it is we're calculating with it. Like when we go to calculate the number of moles of O2, and we use you know six moles of H2 for every two moles of H2O that are produced, or excuse me, well, um, six moles of water for the first step. So if I want to make six moles of water, how much oxygen gas do I need? I just use my two to one ratio from the reaction to get three moles. three moles of O2. A, a great choice for answer would have been nine moles, but it's funny, they don't 
whoever wrote this question wasn't even thinking somebody would use the metro analysis. Why would nine moles have been a good choice? Well, we took six moles and the three moles, but we would be forgetting the four moles that are initially left over, or that are initially present that are then left over after the reaction. And so if I take this and then add the four moles of O2 that are left over, it's like this step here, knowing to add it, or knowing that this is the amount of O2 that had reacted to produce the water, that's the tricky part that we may miss if we just only use the metro analysis and not have some thought of what is actually taking place and what it is we're trying to solve for in the problem. So when we go to calculate the moles of H2 and O2, we're calculating the moles of H2 and O2 that had to be reacted to produce that quantity of water um, by stoichiometry. And we're just adding in the excess reactant then at the end to answer the particular question. So uh, particle diagram question. Now these are kind of intended for us to be able to sketch out or think about what's going on at the atomic level or molecular level. And so here we have six molecules of F2 and six molecules of Cl2 reacting. <clears throat> now it's said in words um, that they're forming chlorine trifluoride. So, because it says um, the below box, F2 and Cl2 reacting to form chlorine trifluoride. And chlorine trifluoride is just Cl F3. And so if we want to balance this reaction out to produce this from F2 and Cl2, then we're probably putting a 2 in front of ClF3 to balance the two chlorines. And we're probably putting a 3 in front of F2 to balance out the fluorines and the ClF3. So to have six fluorines on both sides. And so then in the picture here, we're um, also not told which one is F2, which one is Cl2, but it doesn't matter because there's six of each of them. We have six molecules of F2, six molecules of Cl2. And so I'm just going to call the, it doesn't matter, but I'm going to call the um, Cl2s the black spheres and F2 the gray spheres. And the reason why it doesn't really matter is I'm just going to try to lasso out three F2s with one Cl2. And so I'm just going to lasso this out here. And so I do that process, and these would be gone, and in their place would be a ClF3. Now that could be shown to you two ways, just ClF3 maybe as a formula, or maybe as like three distinct fluorines attached. So sometimes you might see, and there was a problem somewhere on some test that showed kind of like with spheres, like it looking something like this, where the key would be that these two molecules are like distinct from each other, that they're not connected together. The fact that there's two ClF3s doesn't mean that they're attached or right next to each other. These are just particles randomly floating around a container separate from the other ClF3s. And then we can do this again, so we can lasso out um, another set of three F2s and uh, a Cl2 and get another Cl F3 and a second one. And then what's left over? Well, we have these one, two. Well, that one was reacted. Why did I do that? So I don't want to take the ones in the, that have already been lassoed out, but the ones not part of that lassoing are those four Cl2s, or uh, the, the, the four Cl2s there. So we'd have four chlorines just ra randomly in this container. And so then what statement is true, what goes on? Uh, we should have four molecules of chlorine remaining and all the fluorines consumed. And now, you could get there without the lassoing and the sketching and the pictures. Like, you could have just looked and say, saw, okay, three to two, I have six Fs for every three Fs. I need one chlorine, so it's only two chlorines. So the remaining chlorine is six minus two. So probably could get there quicker without sketching, but the idea of sketching is how you can use these particle diagrams to think through at the molecular level what's going on within a chemical reaction. Now, occasionally, in, in fact, I distinctly remember being uh, in your guys' shoes and getting to the first midterm. I gotta be honest with you guys. I don't think we ever reviewed things in class when I was a student. Like, we just would see chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and then like usually we would have lecture like the day of the test on material still on the test, and we'd go take the test, and we'd all fail it and wonder why. 
But um, I remember being on the test, and I was pretty smart, I felt like. Um, and on the test, I could not remember the proton from the neutron. And I'm almost now like, can you imagine? Like, how can you forget the positive charge? That's why it's the, pro the P is positive and neutral is the neutron. Um, and then which one's the atomic number? And the atomic number is defined by the positive charge. But it's good to see this reminder in this example here that what defines iodine to be iodine is the number of protons in its nucleus. That's the atomic number. So atomic number is, of course, the protons in the nucleus. And for iodine, that's element number 53. So it makes iodine iodine is specifically having 53 protons in its nucleus. The mass number is up here. And what we were talking about earlier, the pro proton and neutron carry the mass in the atom, so that's the mass number. This is the 127. It's the sum of the protons and the neutrons. So 127 minus the proton count will give us the neutron count, which will be 74. And then the only way we're getting to a net negative charge is to have one extra negative particle, one extra electron. So that would be not 53 electrons, but 54 electrons. So we can add and remove electrons to go adding electrons to anions, taking away to cations. So I minus would have 54 electrons. So we're here, 53 protons, 74 neutrons, and 54 electrons. I don't want to take for granted this problem here. This is a good one to see um, just in case you're like me and kind of like we're a little bit wishy-washy the difference between atomic number that defines the atom, it's a proton count, the mass number, it's where the mass is in the atom, it's the sum of the protons and the neutrons. How many O atoms are present in a 6.50 gram sample of CO2? Um, so this whole idea here is we can go from atoms to, to molecules to, to moles to grams using things like molar masses, things like Avogadro's number, things like the formula. So let's work out here the number of O atoms in this sample. Now if we're going to get to the two O atoms per one CO2, one CO2 per mole, probably a gram per mole is our first starting point here is use a molar mass. Probably the first starting point of this problem is just how do you know to start with a molar mass? And it's like, I don't know, like somehow we gotta get to the mole to get to the molecule. And so we just start with that molar mass. And then one mole of CO2. Now, there's two different like ways I can do this problem or, or think through it. Um, I'm going to go this way here. Just like a mole of CO2 would contain two moles of O. Like the ratio of CO2 to oxygen is one to two. For every CO2, there's two O's. So if one mole of CO2, two moles of oxygen. I could have just gone to Avogadro's number and then afterwards looked at CO2 and, and said each one CO2 has two O atoms. So I could have done this in the next step, but I'm going to do it here um, just to kind of demonstrate that one mole of CO2 contains one mole of carbon and two moles of O. So pretty obvious, but. Um, and then one mole of oxygen would contain Avogadro's number of whatever this is. That's an O atom. So a mole of O contains an Avogadro's number of oxygen atoms. Six point five divided by forty four point oh one times two times Avogadro's number. So I get one point seven eight times ten to the twenty three. Make sure to have that approved calculator for tonight. Like we're pretty strict about it. Like I don't think TAs will let you use anything but the TI thirty eighty three eighty four. Any of you guys who are taking the Carmen test, is there a calculator that you've seen on Carmen? Has anybody found a calculator via Carmen? I think there is a calculator somewhere on Carmen if for some reason you don't have a calculator tonight or if your battery dies or something. So I think somewhere via Carmen you can find a calculator. I'm not entirely sure where. I think your TAs, the practice in the room should know. Do you guys want to propose, like we have probably enough, I mean I probably have enough, I've just seen what, has, what slides are left to come. I have three slides left to go. I could probably finish these. Is there any specific topics anybody was wanting to hear about if there's anything I haven't talked about Friday or today. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so a formula problem. 
Um, so molecular formula for a compound comprised of 87.7% .7 uh, C, 12.3% H by mass, given molecular weight. I mean, the whole idea here is to go from formula to the empirical formula from the data first and then use the molecular weight to give us the molecular formula. You can probably devise some other ways of solving the problem that can sort of, sort of take a different route than this, but this problem is, is really highlighting, we want to be able to go from the percent data to the empirical formula, and if we have more information, we can take the empirical formula with the next step. So making sure we know how to get empirical formula from our percent mass data, we just take the ratio of the masses of these atoms, 87.7 .7 grams of carbon in ratio to 12.3 grams of hydrogen. I think the key is seeing this as a ratio. It's the gram ratio. We just want to go to the mole ratio and the simplest whole number mole ratio. So we calculate moles. Seven point three zero moles of carbon present in a ratio. to 12.2 moles of hydrogen. And then to get the simplest whole number ratio, one way to do that would be just divide both them by the same number. Maybe the smallest would be an easy number to start with. So 7.3 divided by 7.3 is, of course, one mole of carbon in ratio to 12.2 divided by 7.3 to 1.67. Now, I find here that if you actually use the 1.008 and the 12.01 and be fairly precise in those atomic weights, you'll get a clearer picture here than if sometimes you use rounded values. Um, so just know that sometimes being precise with your atomic weights should get you pretty easy to see numbers here to know, do we take these times two, times three, times four, just think multiples, whole numbers, uh, fraction won't work because one mole times a fraction will always be a fraction. So we want to get a whole number here. And so three will be that number. We got to multiply both of them by the same to keep the ratio intact. So this becomes C3 H5. We multiply by three. And so our empirical formula, C3 H5, the empirical molecular weight, or excuse me, the empirical formula weight, it's not a molecule, the empirical formula weight would be equal to 12.01 times 3 plus 1.008 times 5. That's 41.07. We just divide that into the molecular weight given 164.3 AMU in the problem. So 164 divided by 41.07 is 4. So we have four multiples. So C12, H20 would be the molecular formula. Now, depending if you even, like, if you get this in a multiple choice question, you, you get the, like, one way to think through with multiple choices is just, well, probably only one of those has a molecular weight of 164. So that's one shortcut. If you know to do that, that's fine. Um, if you know that as a check, that's good too. Um, you could also, like some students have been really savvy and have, and this is a completely fine way to solve the problem, is taking the 164.3 um, and just taking the ratio of that mass as the 87.7 and the 12.3 and then just worked out how many atoms of C and H that corresponds to, and guess what, it's 12 and 20. So that's another way you can think through the problem. But I think you can be clever, that's fine. Knowing to be clever is good, but just know that the whole intent of these problems is usually to make sure you can go to formula with the percent data. So make sure you know how to get formula given percent masses. Time to f because that's the key problem that we tend to test. Stoichiometry problem where we have 14 moles of methanol, 24 moles of oxygen reacting here. How much of the excess reactant remains once the reaction is complete? Well, it's two to three for oxygen. So every two methanols, I need three oxygens. So for the O2, off of the 14 moles of methanol, it's for every three moles of methanol, 
I need to react two moles of oxygen with that. And that's equal to 21 moles of O2. So I need 21 moles of oxygen to completely react with 14 moles of methanol. And I have 24 moles of oxygen available. So three moles of O2 is left after that reaction completes. Now I got lucky, you know, in that I started with methanol to O2, and that found my limiting risk excess reactant right off the bat. If I had gotten unlucky and found that I needed too much oxygen compared to what I have available, I just flip the problem. And I just say, how much methanol would I, would I need to react with the given amount of oxygen? So when you see these problems for excess reactant remains, there's other ways you can solve the limiting versus excess reactant problem. But I think it's very simple. It's very quick if we just say, how much reactant do you need to react with the other reactant? And if you get lucky, one step and you're done. Where did you get the three moles of um, This is the ratio in the, oh, am I? Okay, I'm backwards. So I, this is funny. I did the math. Okay. Yeah, good catch. It's two moles of methanol to three moles of O2. I should wear my reading glasses. But I did this problem the other day, and I remember the result. So uh, 14 divided by 2 times 3 is 21. So the number, the result here was right, but the, I, had to, um, I had transcribed the numbers incorrect here. Good catch. Thank you. Okay, two moles of methanol form three moles of oxygen to need 21 moles of oxygen. So like I said, if oxygen was really limiting, just figure out how much methanol you need to react with it and then solve the problem that way. And then uh, lastly, some chapter one vocabulary, um, just to kind of be aware of chemical versus physical reactions. Now, sometimes like I, like when you see like an explosion, we did the H2O2 balloon on the first day we blew it up. Um, now that maybe looks like a physical reaction because you see like the physical um, fire being created, but it's being created by the chemical reaction. So the chemical reaction is what we're really seeing in that example. So when we change the atomic or the bonding nature of the, the substances, then a chemical reaction has been undergone. Imagine trying to put the balloon back together. Think, can we easily just like make the room colder and flip that balloon back into forming? The answer is no. So most chemical reactions you can think of going forward, probably not easily backwards. Um, so if you can imagine structure changing, properties changing, that's a chemical, well, if you imagine the structure uh, of the bonding changing between the molecules, that's a chemical reaction. If you look at adjacent waters becoming unfrozen, that's just a physical change because they can become refrozen. A physical change is just a melting or a boiling. Um, a phase change is the main sort of idea of a physical change. So just solid liquid to gas, et cetera. Uh, we talk about pure substances versus mixtures. And so um, I talked about this in the video I made on, on Friday. You may have seen this. But like ice water is a tricky example. Is ice water a pure substance? It's actually two substances because it's liquid water mixed with frozen water. And liquid water is a different substance, has different properties than frozen water. And so a different substance will have different properties, different characteristics um, from other substances. And so a pure substance is just one uh, substance in one particular phase, um, like all solid, all liquid, et cetera. And, um, and when we say pure, we mean mostly pure. Most things aren't 100% pure. So like 99.9% .9 pure water is just pure water. Um, a mixture is where we have uh, multiple components present. We can have heterogeneous mixtures. We can have homogeneous mixtures. Homogeneous is uniform throughout. Um, a perfectly mixed mixture. Um, is homogenous, even if you can see like evenly spaced different colors, like salt and pepper mix up really well is, I would say, homogenous. But if you have salt on top, all the pepper on the bottom that is separated, then that would be heterogeneous. So different layers is what makes something be called heterogeneous. Ice water, heterogeneous. Different part of the mixture where the ice is to where the liquid water is. Um, element versus compound. Compounds contain two elements. Um, an element is just the simplest building block of matter, is just one type of that element, one type of atom. Um, though you can get into isotopes, how a given element may exist as different isotopes, but all isotopes with the same basic type of atom, the same number of protons. And then a molecule is just specifically where we have the non-metallic elements bonded together um, to, to make, um, so we have at least two atoms present, like H2, O2, F2, et cetera, are molecules, so is water. So CH4, these are all molecular compounds. 
Uh, well, the, these are molecules, but not compounds. These are molecular compounds. Um, sodium chloride is a good example of something that's a compound, but not a molecular compound. It's an ionic compound, not a molecular compound. Sodium metal is an element, not a compound. So metals are just elements, but not compounds. Um, so some of that vocabulary being put into display here. There's lots of things in the early daily quizzes, and then you'll see some questions on those practice review midterms if you haven't seen them yet that get into mixtures and, and molecules and these terms from the early part of chapter one. But if you just know the terms, I think you'll be all set for those questions from the early part of chapter one. All right, so that's um, our last lecture before midterm one. Good luck tonight, um, and I will see you guys back here on uh, Thursday.